Um, so we're going to move on to our, our next uh, speaker now. Our next speaker is from the Rivers Trust. It's Michelle Walker. And Michelle has huge experience in, in, in technical knowledge ar around um, a lot of the, I suppose, the models, GIS, um, et cetera, that's required to underpin a lot of these projects. And um, Michelle herself headed, um, is the, tech, the Deputy Technical Director within the Rivers Trust with responsibility for those areas. And these areas provide support both for the Rivers Trust and also for the CABA, the catchment partnerships as well. And Michelle is now leading on the development of catchment monitoring initiative cooperative as well. So um, Michelle's presentation uh, gives a background to, I suppose, developing the support tools that will be required uh, to support citizen scientists. So Michelle, over to you. Yeah, did. Thank you, Fran. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. So I'm based um, in the southwest of England, uh, near Bristol. I did live for, in Ireland for eight years, so I'm very happy to be invited back, albeit virtually. It's a shame I can't come in person. So I'm uh, yeah, here to talk to you today about some of the work we do um, to support our network of Rivers Trust. So we're the umbrella body um, for the Grassroots Rivers Trust movement. We unite over 60 Rivers Trusts across the UK and Ireland and we offer a combined voice um, developing and delivering large partnership projects and providing technical support and advice and sharing of best practice. Um, we deliver a lot of action on the ground um, and being a sort of umbrella body we can report that up as a, a sort of collective action which really makes a lot of impact. These are some of the stats um, showing the impact of the Rivers Trust movement just in the last year. But we're also part of something called the catchment based approach in England, which is an inclusive civil society led initiative that brings partners together. Um, we bring government, local authorities, water companies, businesses, NGOs, local communities and academia together to undertake integrated catchment planning to improve the water environment. And there are over 100 CABA partnerships across England and cross border into Wales. And the Rivers Trust coordinates and delivers the technical support programme for this wider network of partnerships. And citizen science is a really key tool for Rivers Trusts and catchment partnerships. It's used to engage local communities in understanding the health of their local river and what they can do to help. And if citizens are actively involved in generating this new knowledge, they can act as contributors or collaborators or project leaders and have a really meaningful role in the project. And it's a way to empower civil society to take action, both through identifying issues and then actually tackling them through personal behaviour change or um, the sort of volunteering that you guys have been talking about today, tackling invasive species, habitat improvement, all sorts of action on the ground that really makes a difference. So fundamentally, CABA, the, the Rivers Trust really um, is embedded within, is an evidence-based adaptive management approach. Data and evidence is key to every stage of this process. Um, it helps build the local stakeholder relationships, helps pull together a shared understanding of the issues um, and empowers collaborative decision-making. And we use it for targeting, spatially targeting measures that deliver multiple benefits and bring in these multi-sectoral funders um, to really give bigger bang for our buck. And we use data and evidence to monitor change and evaluate cost, effectiveness, cost effectiveness of measures um, so that we can adjust the plan going forward. And we um, in the Rivers Trust technical team that I um, jointly lead with my colleague Dave Johnson, we really sort of underpin uh, a lot of this approach with um, a whole support programme. We bring a range of skills and experience to help Rivers Trust and catchment partnerships access and use data and evidence throughout that catchment planning process. So we've got skills including GIS, catchment modelling, monitoring, coding, data analysis. And we run a support program that includes webinars, tools, training, workshop, and one-to-one -one support. And we've developed a whole range of technical support resources to help um, guide Rivers Trust and Catchment Partnerships in setting up their own monitoring activities and gathering their own local data and evidence to fill any sort of gaps left in the statutory evidence base. 
So for example, back in 2016, we produced a citizen science and volunteer monitoring resource pack. And this contains guidance on how to plan and set up and safely manage a citizen science programme. It also includes an equipment guide and sample project inventories. And we've got a review of mobile apps and maps for data capture and sharing and a whole set of case studies from around the Cabin network. And I'd just like to give you a flavour of some of these case studies um, now and the best practice that we share and roll out nationally through that technical support programme. So the first example is from West Country Rivers Trust down in Devon and Cornwall. They run a citizen science investigations program that engages volunteers in collecting data and learning about water quality on their local rivers. So volunteers adopt a local site and begin by collecting simple observational data about wildlife and pollution and issues. And they then graduate on to using some simple equipment to regularly measure water quality. And they report this up through a shared data platform. And this CSI data is then integrated with more robust monitoring that's undertaken by West Country Rivers Trust owned staff, their farm advisors and other staff. And the catchments are then scored using all of this data um, against a range of parameters. And those scorecards are used to target um, future river restoration work and farm advice and other measures. So we are looking to share this approach really around the network now and build up that sort of database into a, a more national scheme so that people can take that scheme and, and use it in their own catchments. And another example of a local approach that we're extending outwards is the Thames Water Blitz. This started as an intensive weekend of citizen science activity across the whole river basin. Um, participants will investigate um, a whole range of issues, um, including visual observations, and they use simple test kits to test for phosphate and nitrate. This is now running biannually, um, and it's designed for mass appeal, very low barriers to entry, and it's been a really strong engagement event. Um, it generates high spatial resolution of data, and the results are shared and interpreted with volunteers afterwards. And we're starting to see this approach roll out across the country um, through other catchments now. And we're facilitating that and providing support and advice. Outfall Safari is another um, method that was originally developed by the Zoological Society of London for surveying, categorising and reporting sources of urban pollution. And the method was developed in partnership with the Water Company um, and the Environment Agency. And we've worked with all of these partners now to turn this approach into a toolkit that um, can be used by others around the country. So the toolkit's available online, it's there for anyone to use. Um, it contains practical guidance on how to set up this approach in your own catchment. And we've included templates and technical guidance um, around setting up the data collection apps and templates for the survey form and volunteer training slides and handouts and reporting. And we're now looking to evolve this again into a centralised data system to make it easier for groups to set this up and use it. Another um, case study, we've worked in partnership to redevelop an app that's been widely used to record information about man-made river barriers that inhibit fish migration and natural river processes. So the River Obstacles app um, is about to be relaunched in the next week, hopefully. Um, it's been made more user friendly to enable more crowdsourcing of information to really engage a wider range of people. And um, we're making the data more readily available for others to use so that they can prioritise barrier removal and um, fish processes. So building on all of this, we've got a number of um, training programmes that we run. So that can include um, things like covering strategic monitoring planning and objective setting, um, looking at method comparisons. We undertake practical monitoring. You can see us on the riverbank now, hoping that we can do more of that very soon. Um, we undertake workshops and training in data analysis and interpretation and things like GIS and building story maps to share the results. And the feedback from these workshops shows that they're well received and we know there's an appetite for much more of this type of training and capacity building work in future. And certainly through sort of, you know, more online resources as we're getting used to now, we hope we can, we can sort of spread this much wider. 
But we've also been working to support a growing number of groups interested in monitoring bathing water quality, particularly at the moment. Um, this is a hot topic um, and making headlines in, in the media in England. So, for example, at the popular river swimming site at Worley Weir on the Bristol Avon, um, local swimmers were very concerned about the impact of treated and untreated sewage discharges. And they wanted to understand the risks to themselves and other river users. So we worked with them to run a citizen science water blitz and we engaged the swimmers and the local community in gathering and analysing data about bacterial water quality. And this helped build a partnership approach between the swimmers, the water company, the environment agency and the local rivers trust. And now citizen scientists will be central to the ongoing water company catchment investigations and development of a real time water quality warning service. And we're looking to really sort of build on this. We're partnering with groups like Clean River Ilkley, who've um, successfully campaigned for the first designated river bathing water in England. And we've set up a knowledge hub and, um, you know, running webinars and sharing knowledge on how other groups and grassroots groups can do this with an evidence based approach. And citizen science data gathered across a wide spatial area can fill really important gaps in knowledge. Observations from citizen science can be used in formal weight of evidence modelling approaches to improve decision confidence. And citizen science data can also be used to calibrate and improve the accuracy of catchment models such as SIMAP. Citizens can also be involved in a deeper way to help refine and improve decision support tools. For example, Thames 21 have developed collaborative modelling approaches where the local community are really deeply involved in the whole process of deriving evidence to target action. Um, they get involved in, in ground truthing and gathering data and then actually sitting down with academics to run and refine catchment models to identify best sites for wetlands to tackle urban pollution and flood risk. And we're now starting to explore how citizens can engage in more cutting edge science, such as collecting environmental DNA samples that can be used to monitor fish populations, for example, to protect rare species and target invasive species. And there's also huge potential for citizens to be engaged in building and deploying low cost sensor networks across the country and gathering data at a broad scale that can be used then to train artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that can be used to monitor and predict environmental conditions. So there's a lot of really good stuff going on, but we know we need to do a lot more. There's a growing evidence gap. We've seen real cuts to the statutory um, monitoring budgets. And we need a more integrated approach and we need better ways of working if we're going to address this gap in data and information. All of this sort of fragmented local data collection leads to um, poor decisions, it leads to higher costs ultimately. We've got a limited consistent evidence base that we can use for um, really bringing in the funding for those sort of nature-based solutions and natural capital approaches that we know we're going to need. Um, we also know it's problematic for local catchment partnerships to fund long term monitoring activity and the sort of skill development that they need from their short term project budgets. And, um, you know, we've we've monitored and engaged with the partnerships. So we know what these gaps are. Um, we've done a lot of work over the, the recent years and we know that there's an overwhelming choice of methods and apps and platforms for those looking to fill evidence gaps with new local data. It's really technically challenging to combine and visualise and analyse this data when it's in lots of different formats. Um, so all of this really reduces the, the trust that other stakeholders have in the data and we know that we need to do better. So we've been really busy over the last year building our proposals to really transform what we can do with this citizen science and local evidence base at a national scale. Um, we need a joined up data management system so that we can use all of that local data to produce real actionable insights and better decision making and to really make a robust local evidence base that can be used everywhere. So we've been developing plans for a national catchment monitoring cooperative 
This is modelled on the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative in the USA. We've um, been engaged in knowledge exchange with them and we've gone out to consultation and we've done a lot of work over the last year. And where we have refined the proposal now, we've got some costed options for developing a national government governance framework, some coordination and standardization really with kite marked methods and quality assurance protocols so that the data can be trusted by decision makers. And um, within our proposals, we're looking at injecting more local funding for coordinating and delivering that monitoring and developing the accredited training and technical support and the, the scaling up of the best practice and also the developing the data integration and visualization tools and templates to turn that data and information into knowledge and ultimately action and we've really sort of been working hard on how we can evaluate and quantify the benefits of this approach um, and that's including looking at novel um, funding models such as social bridging finance. And currently we're building ambitious proposals. We're putting together multi-million pound bids to things like the Green Recovery Challenge Fund and the Water Industry Innovation Fund and engaging with the public sector to um, explore how we can make this long term sustainable. So I'd be really happy to um, explore this with anyone who would like to, to also get involved in, in Ireland, really. And just want to say those are my contact details. I'd be very happy to follow up with anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That's a uh, very comprehensive. Sorry, Catherine, I was having problems here with my unmute button. So <clears throat> there's a lot of really, um, a lot of lessons that we can learn over here from the experience over in the UK. And I'm familiar with the, the Thames 21 project, which I think is an excellent approach to uh, working with the, the, uh, the public to try and develop the best places um, for uh, <clears throat> developments, et cetera, um, not just in terms of biodiversity, but also in terms of the of, of wider society as well. So we move on to our, our next and final speakers now. We have, we have a duet here. Uh, some of you may have uh, be familiar with Mary Kelly Quinn and Simon Harrison. Um, Mary is a professor in UCD and um, <coughs> Simon is uh, also a professor down in, in UCC. Both have been working on the, the National Citizen, Sci Citizen Science Freshwater Macrovertebrate Programme that we've been trying to develop um, a framework for for this for the republic, and so they're going to give uh, an update on on where that process is at, and and where um, they would like to go. So over to yourself first, Mary. Thank you very much, Fran, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Fran said, I'm um, going to kick off this uh, double act with an overview of the deliberations and the conclusions of a citizen science working group that came together in May 2019 to explore and sort of reach agreement on a way forward for citizen science monitoring of rivers in the Republic of Ireland uh, that would enable, I uh, suppose, wider and more sustained participation. Um, I mean, our focus at this stage is on what we could call bioassessment using macroinvertebrates because the schemes are there for them and Simon is going to take you through uh, when I finish uh, one of those schemes. Um, the group has um, wide um, representation so we have uh, representation from the EPA, law pro community groups, uh, trainers and also academics. Uh, when we first met, we had to give thought to um, what is citizen science and uh, particularly in the context of river water quality monitoring. And the, the term citizen science, you may know, uh, first appeared in the Oxford English Dictionary in 2014 as the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Now that definition is, is very narrow and doesn't really capture the full potential roles of citizen science. Uh, you know, many versions have appeared uh, since. Uh, for example, the Horizon 2020 program contained a much broader 
definition that spelled out a range of goals from raising public awareness to co-designing projects. And uh, recently the EC, EC Joint Research Centre, uh, JRC, had a similarly broad definition in uh, their very good publication on best practices in citizen science for environmental monitoring. And that same document highlighted that citizen science is about partnerships between volunteers, researchers, and public authorities. And that there are many categories of public participation in scientific investigation from simple data collection in projects that are defined by scientists to active involvement in co-creation of projects. So while the focus is on of citizen science is data collection and its scientific value in strengthening the evidence base for action to address environmental problems, it also has a, it is also a powerful tool for raising awareness of environmental issues informing policies and involving and empowering uh, the, the public. And uh, these are some of the terms that Michelle used. The value of citizen science is now widely recognized in various EU policy documents and in research programs. The European Citizen Science Association and the Citizen Science Global Partnership are also actively in uh, promoting citizen science. And there's even a journal on citizen science. And I'm getting the feeling from this conf uh, conference and from my interaction with various groups that, that there is a real appetite in the public for engagement in river water quality monitoring. Our working group um, recognizes that data sits at the heart of citizen science, but that citizen science projects should contribute to both awareness generation and informing policy and practice. But it needs coordination to elevate it from what is considered a scattered discipline with projects existing in isolation and generating data that may or may not be used. So the working group has considered what makes a uh, citizen science successful and some of the points are highlighted here on the slide. And in fact, they capture the 10 principles of citizen science as defined by the European Citizen Science Association and indeed much of what is con contained in other uh, guidance and as highlighted by Michelle. And I'm going to go through briefly through each of these and highlight where we are in terms of recommendations and even action. So the first question then is, is there a need for citizen science? And I think Certainly, it's, it's a definite yes from me and from the working group. And citizen science has a role to play in so many different projects and addressing so many different um, problems as highlighted by Michelle. But for me, I think citizen science monitoring of rivers in Ireland has a particular role and an important role to play in the monitoring of the 64,000 kilometers of first and second order streams where there are few EPA monitoring points and where we largely don't know the water quality. These streams, as you, you know, are highly vulnerable to pollution and they can also affect downstream water quality. In fact, I know from some of my research projects and, and trying to locate um, study sites that it is very difficult to find unimpacted small streams in the Midlands of Ireland. Furthermore, almost one third of a catchment's macroinvertebrate biodiversity can be unique to small stream networks. We envisage uh, citizen science sitting at what we term level three of a national water quality monitoring framework. To accommodate different levels of interest and engagement, we need schemes that can take, say, the occasional records of what we call a 
spotter through to data from volunteers engaged in regular monitoring. As for the recording schemes or tools, there are a number of small stream um, schemes, so-called SS schemes in operation. And for the training and the materials that we hope to roll out, we're going to concentrate on two open source systems, the Citizen Science Stream Index that Simon will speak about shortly. It's based on just six easily identified indicators so it allows wide uh, coverage of an area and gives an indication of water quality. The small stream impact score in contrast is based on a larger number of indicators but it gives that extra detail and also has the potential to record biodiversity. The small stream impact um, scheme has the same suite of indicators as the, as you can see on the screen there, the SSRS and, and um, SSCS. In the future, we're hoping that we can broaden the toolkit to include some chemistry kits and also consider uh, monitoring of hydromorphology. In terms of resources, and I think this is extremely important for training and refresher courses, we're finalizing a handbook for the small stream impact score uh, with guidance on sampling through to identification. And a handbook is also being prepared for the citizen science uh, stream index as well. And we're compiling other video resource material. Um, Simon and I have been engaged in some training, uh, not as much as we had planned due to COVID restrictions, but we're hoping that we can ramp this up over the summer. Now, coming to something that Michelle highlighted and um, is extremely important, and that is that we generate reliable data and that the data are made accessible. Um, so firstly, we have to ensure that there is a repository for the data and there is a data entry system for the records. So we're working with the data uh, center to enable this, and we will have a common data entry framework that will allow input at levels from phylum through to species. And we'll also capture the data produced by all of the monitoring schemes in, in the country. Secondly, uh, it's widely recognized that citizen science data are actually underutilized because of concerns about data reliability, often unfounded. Um, so we have to, I suppose, create confidence in the data that's generated by citizen science so that the end users will actually use the data. So we're uh, trialing how best to validate data uh, before they're made available and before they're visualized on maps. But I think a lot of it will also come down to training and provision of uh, refresher courses. And here I see a role for a local champion that would be well trained in a broad range of say macroinvertebrate species and can provide that local uh, training. The previous elements, I think, can be relatively easily addressed. More challenging and perhaps more essential is coordination that I mentioned earlier and consideration of how we can sustain citizen science projects so that data needs, the data needed are collected and that volunteer engagement is sustained. You know, projects funded on specific schemes are great, but they usually have a limited life and all the training and interest and so on can be lost when the projects come to an end. For long term sustainability, we see a need for national and regional coordinators working perhaps in parallel with LOCO and together with local champions to identify data needs, coordinate training, and importantly, maintain good communication with volunteers within 
and between projects and with project organizers and other audiences so that volunteers see the results of their efforts and the users see the value of the data. So I would hope in the near future that we might see also a citizen science conference to promote and highlight the valuable work that citizen science can provide. So I'm going to hand you over to Simon to complete the, the presentation. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. I'll stop the share there, so that should allow you to. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mary. Yes, that was uh, excellent. Um, can you see my slides? Not yet, Simon. Okay. They're here now. Yes, see them. There we are. So I'm going to try to get this on presentation view. And it comes up. There we are. Okay, uh, Mary, can you see the slides? Um, Simon, will you go to the top display settings? Yes. And just click that um, and you should get an option, two options. Oh, um, one second now. There we are. Review to slideshow, yeah. There swap. we are. Is that better? No, if you do that again, swap presenter view. Uh, one second now, I'll, I'll share again. One second now. I think that probably should be better. I'm hoping this works. Come along, come along, come along. Resume slideshow. Can you see that's better now? That's much better. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yes. well you gone. Yes, sorry about that little bit of a hitch. Thank you very much indeed, Mary and, uh, and speakers before. Um, so yeah, so I want to just go through uh, a, a scheme that we've developed here at UCC uh, called the Citizen Science Stream Index, and it's a simple, quick aquatic invertebrate monitoring scheme for community groups. And it's myself, uh, my colleagues Tim Sullivan, and my student Brendan McSorley from University College Cork. Um, so to start, yes, or to reiterate what Mary's been saying, the majority of freshwater biomonitoring schemes are indeed based on macroinvertebrates, which shows these characteristic differences in their tolerance to organic pollution. But most schemes, in fact nearly all schemes, involve identifying all the taxa in the stream, or at least most of the taxa, which requires training and expertise. It's, it's, uh, we've been doing it for many, many years, and we sort of, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it comes easy to us, but for most citizens it's quite a challenge. So a scheme based on a small group of indicator taxa may be more accessible for citizens. So can we reduce the expertise needed to engage in invertebrates? I think we can. So this is the kind of scheme we see uh, lots on the internet, These, even a very, very simple one. Uh, I think this is actually very challenging for most uh, non-experts. They appear sort of lots of wriggly uh, worms and creepy crawlies. It's very hard to sift through them. So what I've thought is, well, if you're going to have a, a, a citizen science biomonitoring index for non-specialists, what properties would it have? And I've got four down here. And the first is that a citizen science index must be simple and involve minimal training for non-specialists. The citizen science index would only need to act then as a preliminary assessment of stream water quality with three outcomes, which would be good, uncertain and poor. It doesn't really need to be anything more than that. It's a preliminary assessment. And thirdly, a CS index would have to relate well to other existing biomonitoring schemes. And lastly, results obtained by citizens must be reliable. There should be minimal uncertainty about taxon identity. Now, I know there's been a bit about the chat about how you can verify your taxa, but uh, nonetheless, it is a problem if people are saying, well, I found this, I found that, and it turns out to be misidentification. So how what these three, these indicator taxa that you might use, what would they, what would their properties be? And I, I distilled three here. And the first is that taxa must be easily identified in the field from their shape, their size, their movement, or their color. So someone can spot them and say, yes, that's what it is, visually without need to go to a guide or a key. Secondly, these taxa should respond well to organic pollution and be characteristic of either clean or polluted streams. 
I would say the majority of taxa you find in a stream are actually mildly tolerant and they can be found in a wide range. And lastly, taxa must be common and occur across a wide geographic range. Uh, there's no point in choosing an indicator taxa that's restricted to a certain type of stream or a certain region. So with that in mind, we can look at some of the uh, taxa, some of the, the species or the, the, the groups we find in streams and decide which to use. And the first one here is the stonefly taxa. These are generally all characteristic of good water quality, but they're quite hard to tell apart in the fields. Some of the big perlids are quite obvious, but some of the smaller ones are quite challenging. But nonetheless, they're all reasonably good, well indicative of clean water. So those, as a group, that's a good indicator. The heptagenid mayflies, or the flattened mayflies, they are characteristic of good water quality uh, and also quite visually um, distinctive. They are flat, they scuttle around. Whereas the other mayflies, like the betidae and the ephemeralidae, um, these are actually quite, not only are they very, very common, um, but they're found across a range of water quality. So they don't really indicate whether a stream is clean or not. So we wouldn't use those. Similarly, for the caddis flies, these are a very big group uh, and they're not all very useful for, as indicators. So, for example, the hydrocycidae caddis, the top there, they're tolerant to a range of water quality. And you'll, sorry, go back. Uh, you'll find those in quite a few streams, including polluted ones. Similarly, the philobotamidae caddis flies there on the, on the right hand side, although they're very good indicators, they are very intolerant of water quality. Uh, they're actually very uncommon and, and quite difficult to find. Caddis uh, cased caddis, you can see the group of cased caddis at the bottom there. Well, they're generally quite difficult to identify in the field, and many uh, are, are tolerant of a wide range of water quality, such as the limbophilidae at the bottom. However, riac so we wouldn't think of those, but riacophilidae caddis, these green caddis flies, they're quite common, they're easy to identify, and they are reasonably characteristic of good water quality. So they're a good uh, indicator taxa, whereas these others wouldn't be so good. Gamerous at the top, the water shrimp, very, very common in almost all streams. So as an indicator, not very useful. Then below that, you've got all the, the, the fly larvae, the tipulids and the simulids and all the others. They are quite hard to distinguish in the field and many of them are tolerant to a range of water quality. And below that, you've got the beetles and the bugs and the crayfish. In my experience, they're more indicative of habitat type than water quality, and uh, crayfish are uncommon in Ireland and UK, and in fact, we heard the other day, getting more uncommon, so they're not much good at indicators if they don't occur in a stream. Um, so we would use those. For the poor water quality indicators, you've got the top there, you've got snails, the water louse acelidae, and the leeches. So these gastropod snails, leeches, and acelus have characteristic shape and a movement, and are typically more abundant in nutrient enriched and polluted waters. Below that, you've got things like the Ancylidae, the Spheridae, and flatworms and worms. Some of them are good indicators, but they're all quite difficult to tell apart in the field and rather cryptic. So they're not very good for the non specialist. So, really, we end up with uh, three taxa the green caddis fly, the heptagenia, the flattened mayflies, and the stoneflies that are characteristic of good water quality. And we have three, three taxa, the leeches and the astellus of snails, that are characteristic of poor water quality. And if we look... One minute. Fran, sorry. One minute, I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll ignore this graph then, I'll just go straight through it. This is the, um, the scheme we can, we can develop. It's based on these six taxa. I'm calling the three intolerant or pollution sensitive taxa the good guys, just to make it easier to get across to people and the intolerant ones are the bad guys. All you do is, do they occur in a stream or not? If, they, if the good guys occur in a stream, you get a plus one. If the bad guys occur in a stream, you get a minus one. You take three kick samples, and you simply record the presence or absence of these six indicated taxa in each sample, and it gives you a total score. And we can look at the scores like traffic lights uh, from a, a minus nine to minus five is poor, so on and so forth. Those are very simple indicate, indicative scheme um, there's the three, three kick samples. Again, very, very straightforward. Uh, not much identification needed. Uh, for those who are interested, it does correlate very well with existing schemes such as the Q value and the small stream risk score. So our CSSI score does reflect 
a more intricate version. Um, this is where you might want to use it. Uh, you've got a, this is a hypothetical catchment. These aren't real uh, um, data points at all. But there you've got uh, a point down low, which is a Q value site and it's moderate or poor. Well, where's it coming from? What I think visits the citizen science index is individuals can then move around the stream, taking samples as they go and possibly finding uh, likely sources that may contribute to that poor site. And it is hypothetical, uh, but this is what it can be used for. So large scale, but course, uh, course level. And this is why I think it's so useful. What we call diffuse pollution in the countryside is often uh, more due to more defined sources, such as leaking farmyards and septic tanks. And uh, the, the, both of those streams show kind of gross pollution of organic matter. It is very common in the countryside to see this. Uh, and citizen science, I think, are ID place to locate these kind of sources. Lastly, uh, we've made a little YouTube video uh, demonstrating the uh, it's a tutorial on the methods, and that's available there. There's a link at the top. And if you have any questions, please email me s.harrison at ucc.ie, uh, and I can explain the scheme further to you. So thank you very much, Fran. I hope I didn't go on too long. I'll stop sharing.